Happy Easter 2020. He is risen. Let's start out by singing My Jesus, I Love Thee. So good to be with you here on Easter Sunday in the year of our Lord, 2020, in a year of differences, in a year of changes. But what we're going to be kind of emphasizing today is though things seem to be different in the world, the things that aren't different is that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was raised to life today. He is risen. Amen. You see, he is risen indeed. So glad you're here with us. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much that the Word of God... And the God that we talk about, the Jesus that gave himself on a cross for us, those things do not change. No matter what's going on in the world, we can still stand here and say that though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Lord, so we pray for those that are tuning in today that are perhaps rocked by what's going on in the world. Lord, may they be reminded today that the promises found in the Bible don't change. The promises that God has made for us about eternity do not change. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can rest in that. So now, Lord, we give this hour to you. We pray that the songs that we sing, that the words that we hear that come from the Word of God might encourage us. And in fact, bring us hope. In a day and age where hope seems to be something elusive, we thank you that the hope that comes from the Word of God is able to be found. So, Lord, thank you for that. Be with us throughout this hour. We give it to you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
today we're celebrating Christ's resurrection, and that resurrection is a proof that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice. So the importance of that, that means also that we will be resurrected. So that was a wonderful thing about today. It's all proofs of the reality of Jesus and God's acceptance of his sacrifice. We're going to sing Christ Arose. Christ Arose. <laughs> Easter Sunday, but we're still going to be back here together Easter Sunday evening. It'll be a continuation of what you're going to hear about this morning, things that we think should bring you hope. And so I encourage you to tune back tonight, that Sunday night at 6 o'clock. We'll sing some more songs, one of the ones we didn't do today, but it's a, it's a classic for this day. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. So come back and we'll sing that for you tonight. Uh, and then, of course, Wednesday night is going to be our uh, regular time to Come into the Lord's presence and bring our requests before Him. Uh, you can send us requests a number of ways. You can call the church and just leave a message on the answering machine. You can go to the website and there's a place for you to send us an email and we'll include those requests. And there's uh, my phone number if you just want to call me and say that there's some things that you want us to pray for. So any way you can get them to us. And then also during the live stream itself, there's a place for you to uh, include a request and uh, we'll make sure that those get up to me and we'll be praying about those things. Some of the things that uh, we encourage you to pray for now, obviously we still have a lot of shut-ins that are at some of these nursing homes, and you know that when that COVID gets into the nursing home, it can be a little dangerous. So we've got a few of our folks, Bill LeVere, Carolyn Bjorkman, are in nursing facilities, so continue to pray for them, uh, especially because nobody can come visit. And so you might be facing some isolation, but you have family, their family can't even get there to meet them, so continue to pray for them. Also, Lucy Wilson, uh, the mother of Debbie Rittenauer, we've been praying for her for a while. She was in hospice care. She passed away this last week. So continue to pray for their family uh, as they deal with this grief in the times that we're living in. Uh, I'm calling them the times we might have to call the new normal. You know, when I was in Bible college, uh, we didn't have a class that told us about how to live stream in the midst of a crisis. We're kind of figuring it out as we go. Also this last week, 
I have here a handful of face masks. One of our church members made them and wanted to know what we would do with them. And so we, when you come to our church, we have a welcome table in the back. And we have little bags on there that include information about the church. There's some candy, uh, a pen with the church name on it, stuff like that. But part of the new normal is back there is going to be face masks. It's my belief that even when this ends, in uh, summertime when it dies down, I do think that wearing a face mask is going to be a part of the new normal. And so we're going to have to adjust. But what I want to encourage you with today is that though there may be a new normal in the world, there are some things that don't change based on what's going on in the world. When Christ ascended back up into heaven, he gathered his followers around him and he gave them a task. We call it a mission. And he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded. My friends, regardless of what's going on in the world. And trust me, since the time Christ was here, the world has gone through many occasions like this. What Christ described as times of trouble. No matter what is going on in the world, the one thing that doesn't change is the mission that he's given us. We still need to tell people about who Jesus Christ is and what he has done because that still affects what's going on in the world. So I encourage you that even though it seems like things are different, for us, the mission isn't different. How we do the mission may be. But trust us, here at Salem Bible Church, we're going to keep preaching and teaching the message of Jesus Christ. Because that brings eternal life to people, and it brings hope in the here and now. So thanks for being a part of us. Hope you come back tonight at 6 o'clock. And you can even set up on your Facebook page and invite people to come to a watch party. And we'll try to get more and more people involved in these outreaches that we're doing through live stream. One thing, too, that we've been wanting to do is we want to have a section for the kids. Some things to each week when they tune in that we can maybe send a separate message to them. And so we put together a puppet team, and each week we're going to bring a little, a little kids' time uh, where we can share thoughts and messages. And today we have a kids' time for them that's all about today, all about the Easter story. Hey, Gertrude. Gertrude, you around anywhere? I need some help. Oh, hi, Pastor. How you doing? You know, it's Easter Sunday, and I'm working on a script because I want to be able to teach the kids about the real story of Easter. The story of Easter? Yeah, I think what the problem is a lot of kids have forgotten what the story is all about. They think it's only about maybe the Easter bunny, maybe the Easter eggs. <gasps> The candy. Don't forget the candy. Well, I get that too. I mean, there are certain candies I'm obsessed with, and this year it's a marshmallow egg covered with dark chocolate. Mm. Ooh, it is so good. But the problem is, in the midst of all that, I think that the true meaning and story of Easter has gotten lost, and so I need some help. Okay. I'm wondering if maybe we put our heads together, you and I could come up with a way to teach the kids about Easter. <gasps> you got something? I have an idea. All right. Bert! Bert! Where are you? Bert, I'm right here. Where are you? Bert, did I hear you? Bert! Gert, I'm here. Where are you? Bert! Oh, there you are. Okay, I get it. What got you so excited? Do you remember the hike we went on yesterday? I sure do. The sun was shining and it was so warm. Do you remember the flower we found? The beautiful flower? Of course. Can you get it? Yeah, hold on. Man, what'd you guys find? Look, look. Wow, it's a red rose. Wow, now, now, how did this help you guys? Well, Bert and I saw this. And we started talking about Jesus. You did? Yeah, look, Pastor, the rose has thorns, just like the crown they put on the head of Jesus. I get it. It reminds us about that day. We call it Good Friday, but it was the day when Jesus got arrested. 
And the soldiers were making fun of him. Jesus had told people he was the king of kings. And so to kind of make fun of him, they took these thorns and they weaved them into a crown and they put it upon his head. Wow. And the rose is red. Jesus shed his blood for us. You know, that's true. You know, Gertrude, when God created the world, he put Adam and Eve in the garden and he only gave them one rule. You can't eat from the tree of life. And they did. And sin entered the world. And that creates a problem because sin separates us from God and we can't be in heaven unless our sins are forgiven. Yeah, and, and Pastor, we can't get into heaven by being good. You're right. Or, or by going to church. No, you guys are absolutely right. You know, the Bible tells us that sins can only be forgiven by the shedding of blood. In fact, it says the blood has to come from the perfect lamb. Jesus was the perfect lamb, and that's what he did on Good Friday. He shed his blood. Yeah, so every time I look at a rose, we will think of Jesus. Man, that is a great lesson, guys. The only problem is, though, is I can't finish my script at this point of the story because it doesn't really end when Jesus died on the cross. That's easy. Look at the green leaves. Okay. Green always reminds me of spring. Yes, when the leaves come back to life. Yes, just like Jesus came back to life on Easter Sunday morning. And you guys are right. That is like the best part of the story. If you remember, Jesus had died and he was put in a tomb. And then on Sunday morning, Mary and some of the other disciples were going to the tomb. Of course, they were discouraged because Jesus had died. And Mary, I just imagine she's probably kind of shuffling over. But when she gets close to the tomb, she sees it's empty. And there was an angel there. And the angel said, Mary, don't be sad. Jesus is not here. He is risen. And then poof, the angel was gone. And Mary was kind of confused about what's going on. And then she looks over, and at that moment, she actually sees Jesus. And she's just so excited, she just doesn't know what to do. She's just almost absolutely jumping for joy. I jump for joy every time I hear the story. You know, and Mary couldn't contain herself. She actually ran away from Jesus, and she got to the point where everybody she saw, she said and shouted as loud as she could, Jesus has risen. Wow. Oh, so you see, Pastor, the rose tells the whole story of Easter. You know, that's exactly right, guys. Thank you so much. But, but Pastor, I have one more idea. Okay, Gertrude, this one was good. What else you got? Okay, I think every kid watching should ask their parents to read them the whole story of Easter. No, that's not a bad idea. It's a good way for families to get together. You get out the Bible and you go either Matthew 27 and 28 or John uh, 18 and 19 and you could sit together and read the story and kind of remind yourself what it might have been like that day. And then, of course, because of you guys, kids, every time you look at a rose, you're going to be reminded of... The thorns remind us of the crown of thorns. And the red rose, the blood that was shed. And, of course, the green leaves, the fact that Jesus was raised to life. Kids, I want you to enjoy the Easter egg hunt. I want you to enjoy the Easter candy but I don't want you to actually ever forget the story. And I think the best thing to do is I'm going to let these guys finish it. Never forget Easter is the day Jesus came back to life. Sing, I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary.
Well, thank you so much, Steve and Heidi and Kara and Howard and Jody, uh, part of the, the crew, the team that's here. If you'd like to turn ahead, I would encourage you to go to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 27 is where we're going to be starting out today. We're going to be spending most of our time uh, at that passage. If you were here with us on Friday... We gave you a message of hope. Perhaps you didn't understand why, as believers, we call that day Good Friday. And so we spent the entire time together explaining what happened on that day and the reason why today we call it Good Friday. But this morning I wanted to kind of change up a little bit and remind you that on that day that now we call Good Friday a day that we say was filled with hope, for the followers of Jesus, it was just the opposite. If they would have named it, they would have probably called it Black Friday. Remember, they had spent three years with Jesus. They were friends together. They had watched him as he, as he did one miracle after another. They'd been with him when crowds, thousands of people were following him and he was touching the lives of the people. He had talked about the fact that he was the king and they were, I think in a way, hoping that at some point he was going to fulfill that by having an earthly kingdom. And all of a sudden, in one moment, it all comes crashing down. He gets arrested. He gets beaten. The crown of thorns placed upon him and then literally has to go up to the hill and he is crucified and dies. And the leaders wanted to make sure that the, the people didn't try to steal the body because Jesus had been saying he would be raised from the dead. And so they placed soldiers outside the tomb. We look at that day and we talk about it being a day of hope. But for them, there was no hope. My friends, the good news in this story is that those things that happened on that Friday didn't end there. It didn't end with that picture of no hope and soldiers guarding the tomb. Sunday morning was about to come and hope was going to burst forth. A hope that will affect them and affects us today. My friends, perhaps you are a lot like these folks during the time of Jesus. It's easy to be rocked by what's happening and to kind of lose sight of hope. It's happening today. I put up a video. I have a web channel called OCD Bible Study. It's also a Facebook page. And I posted a little five-minute video about how you can survive and get through this crisis without panicking. And one of the things that I suggested on there was stop watching the news. Watching the news can be depressing. We already know what they're going to say. It's bad. Now, I watch the news because I want to stay current so I can help you know what's going on in the world, but i got to be careful myself. See, this is the time of year. April is not my favorite month. I don't like the fact that you probably experienced it. Remember Thursday? I'm outside with a T-shirt and the sun is shining. <laughs> and literally, Friday, I was scraping the snow off my windows. That's depressing a lot, enough and then add to it that I'm locked down, it's discouraging. This should be the time of the year, too. I usually go over to the Suburban Collection. That's kind of our big show place for events. Camper show is there. And about this time of year, it's the uh, motorcycle show. I have a motorcycle, and I like to go there and see what, what's new in the world. There's going to be no motorcycle show this year. In fact, last night, the Suburban Collection was on the news but not because there's going to be an event or show, but because they cleared out the inside of the showroom floor and they're beginning to set up hospital beds in case there's an overflow of the coronavirus patients. Wow. 
It's easy to watch that and feel just like the disciples did, the friends of Jesus did on this weekend. And hope is gone. My friends, today we're going to give you hope because we're going to finish the story that began on our Good Friday, their Black Friday, and ends on Sunday morning, which started out in a moment of discouragement and ends in a moment of joy. This morning we're going to take a few moments to look at glimpses of God's power that will bring us hope. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, the crisis that's going on in the world is real. Thousands of people are losing their lives. In fact, in some cases, almost a thousand a day in the New York area. Father, it's easy to get overwhelmed and to get to the point, perhaps as the followers of Jesus felt on that weekend, that hope is gone. Lord, we have an advantage that they didn't have. We have the entire word of God. We know the complete story. Perhaps there are some today that have lost hope and they feel much like the followers of Jesus did on that weekend. It's Sunday morning, you've gotten up and you're not even sure if you want to get out of bed because the reality of this crisis is overwhelming. Pray today, Father, as we complete the story of this week, It began on a high note on Palm Sunday, that ended in discouragement on Friday, and now bursts forth with hope and joy on Sunday morning. I pray, Lord, for those that are listening and watching who've been discouraged by the trouble that's going on in the world. Lord, may they be encouraged by this story and what's connected to it. The love of God, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that has changed our world, changed eternity. Lord, encourage us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 27 is the place. And I mentioned to you that if the disciples had been looking, even on that Friday, there were glimpses of the power of God. And the reason I want to share it with you, because it's easy when you're overwhelmed to forget that there are glimpses of that power all around us. So let's put ourselves back to that Friday. They're at the cross. They've watched their friend be crucified. And you know the crucifixion is a horrible death. And they listened as Jesus was there and he said those words, it is finished. And he died. And I can imagine the followers were just so discouraged at that moment. But if they had been paying attention, there were glimpses of what was coming, glimpses of the power all around. Today we're going to look at four of those glimpses, four of those reveals of God's power. And trust me, by the time we're done today, you will have hope restored. Because my hope is not based on what's going on in the world. My hope is connected to the word of God, the promises that are there, those that never change. So let's look at the first one. This is Matthew chapter 27, and I love this. Go back, Matthew chapter 27. Let's, we'll back up right to the point where Jesus is about to die. Let's go to verse 50, because there are some exciting things that are happening. So it says, Jesus had cried again. He shouts, it is finished, and he gave up his spirit. Now listen, at that moment, the curtain in the temple, that curtain was probably about a foot thick, was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. Man, it was dark, an earthquake comes, you could almost feel the power of God at that moment. My friend, God still has that power today. You see it displayed in the world all the time. But just like the disciples missed it at that moment, sometimes we miss it. I used to live in California. 
and they have more earthquakes than we do here. I've been here, this is my 27th year here, and one time we had one small earthquake and I, I felt it shaking a little bit. But in California, they get a lot of earthquakes, they get a lot of nature in action, a lot of mudslides. So I was living in California, and at the time I was driving a 1971 Volkswagen van. It was, oh, it was so cool, though it was beige. I should have painted that thing. I hate beige. So on one occasion, we had driven up to Medford, which is the nearest town from us. And to get there, we drove on this highway called 197. And if you're ever in California, you've got to drive on it. It's just beautiful. And we we're coming back from Medford, and it was just pouring rain, and you could almost feel the ground rumbling. The storm was just raging. So I'm, I'm, I'm hanging on on this thing, because this 197 is a twisty road. I'm getting ready to turn one corner, but as I'm turning the corner, I can see some lights flashing, which is unusual, because there's, there's not much traffic on this road. So I begin to slow down, and as I, I make the turn around the corner, I see a a state police car right off to the side. And in the middle of the road was a boulder that looks just like the one in the picture. I mean, the Volkswagen van was probably six and a half foot tall, and this boulder was bigger than the van. And I'm stopped. I'm just so thankful that the police got there first because I would have turned that corner and would not have seen it. And I wouldn't have been here today to share you hope because the Volkswagen van does not have a lot of space in the front. It would not have been good. So I thought about that rock tumbling down, and I think about this day with the earth moving and rocks literally being split in half, my friends. Those were glimpses that God was giving of the power that he has. How do you still see glimpses of his power today? I believe it's all around us. I think you can see it right now if you just look outside. I was telling you this earlier in one of our messages. This is the time of year when the leaves are just beginning to bud. So even though we had that crazy snow on Thursday, my tree still had the buds beginning to come back to life. That should always be a reminder to you of God's power. You should be in awe of the fact that when wintertime comes, that these trees created by God, know that winter's coming. And they go, oh, we got to get ready. So they shed all their leaves, and then they go to sleep. They don't have to deal with the winter and the snow and the wind and the rain and the ice. They just stay asleep until spring, and they burst forth to life. My friends, those are glimpses of God's power. And those glimpses should begin to bring hope to you because it's a reminder that God is in control. Let me tell you, the glimpses on that day get better. And the next one is my favorite one. Matthew chapter 27 again, but now move into the next verse, verse 52. Listen to what happens. So the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split, the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection. They went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Man, people are being raised from the dead. I'm still kind of mystified that the, that the followers of Jesus didn't see this stuff and go to the tomb on Sunday morning with a little more anticipation. There are holy followers who had died or are now walking around. There were some people that understood what was going on, that grasped these glimpses of power. How do I know? Keep reading just a little bit. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake... And all that had happened, they were terrified. And in fact, it led them to exclaim, surely he was the son of God. Wow. When I read these stories, I'm always trying to encourage you to do the same thing. Don't just read them like words on a page. Slow down 
and try to picture yourself there. So you're living in the time of Jesus. You're hearing about all these things that are going on. Maybe you didn't even go to the actual crucifixion scene, but everybody knows what's going on because Jesus was the talk. Long before social media, there was a buzz about Jesus. You've read it. Every time he would go to a new city, people would be talking, Jesus is coming. And then crowds would just gather. Well, on this day, the buzz was, Jesus is being crucified. And then just imagine when it neared the hour when he's about to die, and it tells us that just before this earthquake, the clouds come over, it gets pitch black. And then the earth starts to shake. And homes are shaking and rocks are splitting. And so maybe you're a little bit nervous. And so you're backing up in your house and you're sitting down going, I don't know what's going on, but I'm hanging on. And then things settle down. You start to breathe a little, a little better. And you, you look to your wife and kids and you go, woo, woo, that was pretty exciting. And all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. And the door pops up. It's Grandpa! And the kids go, but Grandpa died. My friends, this is an exciting time. The dead have come back to life, and they're walking through town and talking to everybody. Look, I'm back. The Bible is filled with stories that remind us of the power that God has. I hope you're catching some of these glimpses because I want you to be encouraged today because this weekend, actually this whole week that started on Palm Sunday, it kind of reaches a crescendo on Good Friday. At least you think that's the high point and then Jesus is killed and then it bursts forth in the song on Easter Sunday morning. All of these things were written so that you and I would have a couple things. First of all, we would understand who God is. He's a God that loves us, right? Good Friday is all about God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So this week reveals to us who God is and also what God can do. My friends, glimpse number two here is a reminder. What can God do anything? He's able to bring the dead back to life. That means whatever it is that you're going through today. And listen, all of us that are here, just like you, I have moments myself where the nerves and the worry about today kind of build up. I had it, I don't know why. I, I thought I loved coming and talking to you guys on Good Friday, bringing you hope. Whatever reason, Friday night, I was just kind of overwhelmed. I had a hard time falling asleep. I was starting to worry about what's going to happen next. Just like you, I had to turn to the Word of God and remind me, remind myself about who God is, a loving God that sends Jesus, and what can He do? He can do anything. So no matter what we face today, here is a reminder that God is able. I just try to imagine the, the, the different homes where people were coming back and the buzz that was building about the events of this moment. The dead coming back to life. Let's keep reading, though. Let's find our way into chapter 28. And I got so excited, I put, oh, there it is. I put my remote down. Glimpse number three. Chapter 28, let's start reading in verse one, and we're going to read our way all the way down through verse six. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Here we get another one. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb rolled back the stone and sat on it. I would love to have seen that. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. I'm almost picturing them just kind of boop, falling over. 
angel, though, says to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. The third glimpse of power are angels in action. And it appears to me they've got power. Because they arrive on the scene and another earthquake happens. It seems like God likes to use earthquakes to get our attention. A little side note here. My friends, don't be surprised if God isn't using this current time of trouble to get our attention. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords wants us to serve him to make a difference for him, to tell his story. So, maybe we should use this as a little bit of a wake-up call. I hope we don't get one of these earthquakes, but boy, it sure gets people's attentions here. So here's this angel, and I, I got a picture up of what I call a warrior angel, because I this is how I always picture angels. They got these beautiful wings, they got swords, and whenever they want, it could just burst into flame. Pretty cool. And this angel's there, just kind of touches this giant, giant stone, and just, boop, it just rolls away. Think of the power that they have. You ever try moving some stone? Recently, my son-in-law had this project in mind, and he had some concrete that was left over from the old owner of his house, and he wanted to get rid of it. And so I head over there, and in the middle of heading over there, I see the piece of concrete, maybe about, I don't know, two foot by two foot, maybe about a foot and a half thick. And he says, you know, well, help me move this thing. <laughs> we try to lift this thing. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So then I got a sledgehammer and I just started smacking on it and I got it down into more manageable pieces. And I'm struggling to move these things. And now I'm thinking of the size of the stone that was in front of this tomb and the angel just touches it and it rolls away. My friends, be encouraged today that there are angels, they have power, and one of the things that falls into their area of responsibility is protecting you and I. Now, how do I know that? Well, I'm going to take you back to a verse that I had read to you when this began. Let's go back to Psalm chapter 91. Psalm 91 and verse 11. Take me back one, Howard. I got a little carried away. Psalm 91 and verse 11. Now, if you've been with us on Wednesdays, I'm encouraging everybody that's watching this, I want us to memorize all of Psalm 91. It is filled with hope. It's filled with encouragement. And so use this time at home to memorize. What I've done is I got myself some three by five cards. That's how we used to memorize. And I'm handwriting out two verses per card and I'm trying to memorize it. And as soon as I get it done on Wednesday night, I'm going to share it with you by memory. And I've been encouraging you, memorize this chapter and then record yourself saying it. Why is memorizing important? These times of trouble are real. It's easy to get overwhelmed when you don't even expect it. Maybe you hear about something that happened. You hear about a loved one who is ill and, and your heart begins to shake immediately. And you don't have the Bible right around. When you've memorized the Word of God, when you hide that in your heart, then when fear and anxiety begins to build up, you can just quote to yourself the Word of God. And Psalm 91 is filled with great things that can encourage you. Matter of fact, you know what? I have a few minutes. Let's just start in verse 1. Follow along with me because you'll never get tired reading this chapter. Psalm 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. 
He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is your refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. Now here's verse 11. For he will command his angels, these same powerful angels we just read that flicks a stone aside, an angel that causes an earthquake when he just lands on top of the stone, those angels, he will command them concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Wow. There's a dimension around us of activity that we can't see. There are angels and demons at work in the world. Scripture makes it clear that those things are happening. And so right now, there are angels, I think, that are protecting us. Why? Because Satan hates us telling you about the power that God has, the power to bring you hope and healing in the midst of trouble. So I guarantee you there's some battles going on right now, but this is a reminder That these angels that God sends, they have power. There's one last reminder, one glimpse of that power. Let's go back to the book of Matthew. Back to Matthew chapter 28. I read it, but I want to reread it for you. Matthew chapter 28. So now we've got this picture that not only did they get glimpses leading up to Sunday morning, the earthquake, the dead being brought back to life. Now they see an angel, the empty tomb. The reminder that he is not here. He is risen just as he said. The fourth glimpse of the power is, of course, the empty tomb. My friends, the Jesus that we're talking about today is not some hero that lived and died. He's a Savior that lived, gave his life willingly, and was raised from the dead and is alive today. This is the moment when their lack of hope bursts into hope. Let's keep reading. Matthew chapter 28. So they get this message from the angels in verse 7. He's risen from the dead. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. But suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he says. They came, they came to him, they clasped his feet, and they worshipped him. And now something that maybe you need to hear today. Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Wow. My friends, be encouraged today. This isn't just a story in a book. These are events that happened, all designed to give you a reminder that the power of God exists. In this church, we believe the tomb was empty. We believe that Jesus is alive, and we believe that Jesus is alive today. I want to leave you with one last verse, a reminder of where Jesus is at today. Turn with me and go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. And this is a verse you might want to read with the family later on today because there are so many wonderful truths in this. Truths that will once again, yes, bring us 
some hope. Galatians, Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse... Oh, man, that's just such good stuff. we got to back up to verse 15. For this reason, Paul says, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ... The glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Here's where it gets good. I pray also that the eyes of your heart, that's what we're trying to do today, enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God has placed all things under his feet, and appointed him to be head over everything in the church. Hey, sorry for any network glitches. Why, why, why is there some glitches going on? Because there are churches all across America trying to live stream at this exact moment because they believe what we believe. That Jesus was raised from the dead and today he is seated on the throne of God watching over and worried about everything that's going on in your world, in my world, and in the church's world. I put it this. Though the world seems to be crumbling and we are clearly in a time of trouble, I want to leave you with this thought. He is still on the throne. I mentioned something to you that I don't want you to forget. I think this whole week, starting from Palm Sunday to Good Friday to Resurrection Sunday, were designed for two reasons. <clears throat> One, to let you know who God is. We talked about this on Friday. Who he is is a God of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ died on a cross for you and I. As we tried to teach the kids today in that little puppet play, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it started a flow of sin that affects everybody. The scripture says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's you, that's me. And because that sin is there and we have fallen short of God's glory, we can't make it into heaven on our own. The puppet said you can't do good things to get you in. Going to church doesn't get you in. Growing up in a family that followed God doesn't get you in. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Romans 6.23 says, yes, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what happened? Jesus died on that cross. He shed his blood so that Our sins could be forgiven, and he offers that sacrifice as a free gift that you and I accept. I accepted it when I was seven years old. I was in a Sunday school class, and my teacher told me this story and asked me if I wanted to accept his gift of eternal life, salvation. And I remember her taking me off to the side, and I prayed and asked him to come into my life to forgive me, cleanse me of my sins. So we want you to know this week who God is. A God of love. A God who loved the world so much that he gave his life for us. And the second thing is, this week gave us a glimpse of what God can do. The fact that he was raising Christ back from the dead, and of course, a lot of other people too, 
is a reminder that no matter what you're facing today, there's nothing he can't overcome. My friends, if you don't know Jesus, make sure you accept his free gift of salvation. And if you know him and your heart's been a little bit overwhelmed, remember today, he is still in control. Come back tonight. We'll share you more glimpses of that power, more reminders that he is in control. Father, thank you so much that we have this ability to tell the world about you. And even though there seems to be some glitches in the technology, the message doesn't change. This week was a reminder of who you are, a God of love, a God that loved us so much he was willing to sacrifice, and a reminder of what you can do, and what you can do is everything. With God, all things are possible. Lord, encourage hearts with these truths today. Bring us back together tonight, and once again, be reminded of your power and how that power brings us hope. Thank you for these things today, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.